Hey, eh? G'day mates. Happy Friday to you all. This video is sponsored by Guinness Draft 0%. Guilt-free pleasure. Irish soup in a can. Let's go. Now today I've got a great little Sleep HQ case study for you. It's a little bit of a mystery. Let's check out what Jason has to say here. When I went on vacation, I bought my ResMed 11 machine with me. Unfortunately, my tube had a minor kink in it, which created a small hole. Since I was on vacation, I couldn't easily get a replacement hose, so I just used as is for the week. This caused my AHI numbers to spike for the week. Now, when I look at my trend charts, they're completely thrown off by the anomalous data. Is there a way to remove or ignore the data for that week? I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So I clicked his share link, and this is what it shows. Have a look at this. So here's his AHI trend, cruising along here, less than one. And then out of nowhere, whoop, 18.31, 21.01, Now, your dog could take a great big bite out of your CPAP tube and it's probably not gonna cause that spike in AHI. And you can see it right here as well. Everything else is the same. And if you come down here, have a look at this. Here's the big spike. The actual leak rate is low. Look at it. It's the lowest it's ever been. Settings are the same. But he's gone somewhere that's affecting his breathing. High altitude. <laughs> Let's check it out and then I'll explain what's going on here. Here are his results when he's at normal altitude and they're great. AHI 1.05, 99.89% vitality and he's in the top 1% of all users on the Sleep HQ database. All right, so he's kicking goals. When he went on vacay, he went to New Mexico and I've seen a few people go to New Mexico now and have these results. I'll show you another one in a moment. And all of a sudden, now he's in the bottom 0.01% of all users. How the mighty have fallen. And now his apnea hypopnea index is 50.09. And we can see here on the AHI donut that most of this is clear airway. This is central apnea. The airway is not obstructed. There's not an obstruction there. The airway is open. But his brain is telling him, hey, stop breathing, stop breathing, stop breathing. I'll tell you why in a moment. And if we come down here, we can zoom in on the breathing trace and we can check out all these clear airway events. And I want to show you this here because this is a big problem. So here's all the clear airway apnea, 16 seconds, 15 seconds. It's just a beautiful cycle. Pause, couple of breaths, pause, couple of breaths, all right? But you'll see here, all of a sudden, into the mix, we have these obstructive apnea events, these yellow flags, one here, one here, one here, and we get these great big jumps in pressure. One centimeter jump there, one centimeter jump there. Up here, 10.6, which is as high as his device can go. You can see it here, 10.6 is the max. Probably lucky that he's got that max of 10.6. Otherwise, it might've gone much higher with these two OA flags here. But the big problem is this, guys. These are not obstructive apneas. They're clear airway, just like the rest. So these pressure jumps are not gonna do anything, as you can see, it doesn't change anything because there is no obstruction. And this is just one of the many flaws associated with automatic pressure delivery. Yeah, a lot of the time the machines get it wrong, like it has right here. And when it gets it wrong, it causes all sorts of issues. Now, the reason Jason is having so many central events is because when he's gone up to high altitude, there's less oxygen in the air. And so he has to breathe faster 
and deeper hyperventilation to bring more oxygen into his body because there's less of it in the air, okay? But when he does that, it has the unintended consequence of blowing off carbon dioxide, right? So he's taking these great big deep breaths to get the oxygen in, but at the same time, because of that, he's expelling all that carbon dioxide. And so the pH of his blood starts to rise, respiratory alkalosis. And once again, your body is just like trying to balance everything up, yeah? It's trying to maintain a nice stable pH for respiration, for gas exchange. So when that starts to happen and the pH starts to rise, the body naturally tries to balance it out. And how does it do that? Have a guess. You hold your breath. Yeah, it's a pause in breathing to bring the CO2 levels up, which is gonna make the blood more acidic. Yeah, the pH starts to drop, brings it back down again. It's just trying to balance everything out. This is why I'm really starting to thumb my nose a bit at automatic pressure delivery, because we're just not made to be breathing against frequent pressure changes. The body is looking for stability. And it's very hard to achieve stability when every minute you're moving the goalposts. Yeah, you're changing tidal volume. You're changing the respiratory rate and the body's going, fuck, how do I deal with this? And you can see it right here. Take a look at it. So have a look at the breathing here. Look at the amplitude of the breaths. We get this incorrect flag. They're saying it's obstructive apnea. It's not essential apnea. The pressure jumps, look at this, 8.94 to 9.84. Only one centimeter, it's a decent jump. Look what it does to the breath. Look at the size of the breath now. Like over here it was what, 42? Now look at it up here, 78. So that one centimeter jump in pressure has essentially doubled the size of the breath. And this is exactly what we're trying to avoid at this point in time. Yeah, like I said before, we, we don't wanna blow off more CO2. We want smaller breaths to bring the pH down. And you can see it here, you can see it here again. Look at this one up here, 98, did it get to 100? Oh, yes, <laughs> 100, no, no, we don't want that. So this is contributing to the clear airway events. Treatment, emergent, central sleep apnea. These are people who previously had no central sleep apnea. They start CPAP therapy, and then they start having all these clear airway central events. Why? Because of this. It's the body, once again, trying to balance everything out, balance out that pH. And like I said previously, he's kind of lucky that he's got his pressure max set to 10.6 here. The machine can't go above 10.6 because we've already hit 10.6 here. And we've got another misclassified obstructive apnea event here and one here also. So that would have set the pressure up even higher, which would have made the breaths even larger, blow off more CO2, more clear airway events. The take home message, automatic pressure is not very accurate. And if we reset the charts, we just looked at this jump here. You know, if we come across here, it'll be the same thing, another pressure jump. There we go. Another random OA flag in amongst all these clear airway events, pressure jump. All right, reset the charts. Where's another one? Come over here, another one here. Same thing again. He hasn't even fallen asleep here. Yeah, he just put his mask back on. It's only been one minute. And look, boom, up it goes, up it goes, up it goes. <laughs> See? He hadn't even fallen asleep there. Once again, this time it's working him up. Look, boom, boom, wakes up. Any more? What about here? Same thing again, okay? It's throwing breathing out of balance. Now, something else that's really important is this. EPR, expiratory pressure relief, which is currently off and that is a good thing. When you increase EPR, 
right? That is the difference between the pressure when you breathe in versus the pressure when you breathe out. When you breathe out, there's a lower pressure. When you create that gradient, we call it pressure support, what it does is it helps to ventilate patients, which is removing carbon dioxide. That's what it does. If we go from pressure support of two to three, we're gonna be removing more carbon dioxide. If we go to three to four with a bi-level, four to five, once again, we're removing carbon dioxide. And as I've just shown you, if things get out of balance, we remove the CO2, we're blowing off CO2 because of this pressure support, well, the pH is gonna rise. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I love how the flavor just stays in my mo as well. Just lick it for days, just taste that sweet, sweet Guinness. Now, if you permanently move to a high altitude location, or even after a couple of days, your body will start to acclimatize. Isn't that amazing? Just love it. So after only a couple of days, your kidneys will start to excrete bicarbonate, which has the effect of lowering pH. Same thing as holding your breath, essentially, but more of a long-term solution. And then after a week or two, you'll be like fully acclimatized because because your body starts producing more erythropoietin, which increases the red blood cell count. Have you heard of uh, high altitude training before where the athletes go high altitude, more blood cells, more efficient oxygen delivery to your organs, to your tissues when you're an athlete? Same sort of thing. And once again, if we've got more red blood cells, more oxygen carrying capacity, well, you got more tolerance to the lower oxygen level at high altitude, so you're less likely to hyperventilate. All right, here's another really fascinating profile. Once again, data recorded in New Mexico City. All right, and he is in the bottom 0.3% of all sleep HQ users. Not having too much fun. Apnea hypopnea index of 16.25, but as you can see, we've got a mix. Clear airway, obstructive apneas, and hypopneas. Now he is in CPAP mode. So one fixed pressure, you can see it here, one set pressure, and the pressure is 10 centimeters, and he has EPR off, tick. We don't want EPR on when we're at high altitude. But if we come down here, let's take a look at it. Now in the beginning, we have these clear airway events like we saw previously. And if we come down here, you can see we have this flow limit, this is airflow limitation, and there's no evidence of any air, we've got a tiny little bit here, 0.03, but no airflow limitation. And this is a great indication that the airway is indeed open. There is no obstruction because there's nothing registered here on the flow limitation trace and flow limitation is a measurement of upper airway resistance. Think of it like if you've got a tube and I start like pressing in on that tube and you're trying to suck through it, you're gonna get added resistance, okay? Or if the, I've got a cramp in my finger, ah! If the airway, or if the tube is very narrow, the narrower the tube, the greater the resistance. This is why, tangent, with your CPAP machine, you have the standard and slimline settings, yeah? You know what happens when you change that to slimline from standard slimline? It increases the pressure to overcome the added resistance, yeah? Because you get a drop in the pressure because of the resistance of the narrow tube. Getting off track. Um, all right, so take a mental Snapshot there, central apnea, no flow limitation. I'll reset the chart and we'll come over to this section here. Why not? Can you see the difference? Look at all the air for limitation now. All right. And we have these rear flags, respiratory effort related arousals. They don't quite meet the threshold of a hypopnea or an obstructive apnea but it is causing you to wake up. That's the arousal part. 
your breathing is causing sleep disturbance. And this is stuff that's just not mentioned in the My Air app and so on. And this is why you need to start using Sleep HQ, guys, because um, you can see one here. There's lots of them. So right now, you guys could be having 10, 15, 20, 100 of these a night. You wouldn't know because it's not part of the AHI, but it's going to cause a lot of sleep disturbance, okay? And if we come across to this central period again, look, central apneas, no flow limitation. Reset, come to this section here. We've got messy airway, obstructive apneas, rearers, hypopneas, all this flow limitation. So this guy's in a bit of a pickle here because he's caught between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, he needs the pressure to stop the obstructive apneas. Otherwise, he's gonna hyperventilate. You can see it here. And when you hyperventilate, he's gonna blow off the CO2 and it's gonna cause central apneas. But on the other hand, well, we don't want too much pressure because that's probably gonna induce central apnea as well. So what can we do for this patient? We're caught between a rock and a hard place. Well, the first thing we need to do is sort out these obstructive events. We need to stent the upper airway because it's no good having all these obstructions and then these periods of hyperventilation here and here and here and here. Yeah, it's gonna blow off all that CO2. It's gonna cause the centrals. So step one, fix the obstructions. Step two, we need to compensate for the lack of oxygen in the air at high altitude. And to do that, we need the help of an oxygen concentrator. We need supplemental oxygen, and that's gonna link in to a little adapter that sits between his device and his tube, and it's just gonna gently stream in concentrated oxygen to lift the level of oxygen that's currently in the air, so that in the air, so that he doesn't hyperventilate and get the central apneas. Anyway, mates, I hope you enjoyed the video today. If you did, make sure you smash that thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. And if you like, you can also track your blood oxygen on Sleep HQ, which is a really handy feature using a Sleep HQ O2 ring. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Happy Friday. Have yourselves a great weekend. I'll see you soon. Cheers.